welcome. It's good to see you all. Uh, my name is uh, Michael Spath, and I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace. We're a voice of conscience for peace, justice, human rights, and intercultural encounter. I'm also a member of the uh, United Church of Christ Palestine Israel Network and uh, Global Kairos for Justice Coalition. Um, we have a full menu of questions for Mazen, but if you want to share a thought or, 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 or something to share, please do that via the chat function at the bottom of the screen. Today's interview will be recorded, uh, and uh, in a couple of days, it'll be available on our Indiana Center for Middle East Peace YouTube channel. I'll also be sharing it with our co-sponsors, and let me show you who they are. The Israel-Palestine Mission Network of the Presbyterian Church USA, Episcopal Peace Fellowship, Palestine-Israel Network, Friends of Sabil North America, Joining Hands for Justice in Palestine and Israel, United Church of Christ, Palestine, Israel Network, uh, the uh, Palest Palestine Christian Alliance for Peace, um, the uh, 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 Quaker Palestine Israel Network, Menopin, the Mennonite Palestine Israel Network, Disciples Palestine Israel Network, and Kairos West Michigan. Today, we're excited to be talking with our friend, Dr. Mazen Kumsiya of the Palestine Museum of Natural History and the Palestine Institute for Biodiversity and Sustainability at Bethlehem University. Mazen, it's a real pleasure to have uh, this conversation with you. Welcome. Thank you very much, Michael, for having me. Yeah, let's get right into it, okay? Uh, Mark Braverman and I were delighted to spend some time with you and Jesse at the Museum and Institute just a few weeks ago when we were at the uh, uh, Global Kairos for Justice uh, meetings. Many of us in, in attendance today have, have been there at the Museum and Institute, but I'm also aware that many others haven't had a chance to visit. You and Jesse moved back to Palestine after a career teaching in American University, and you created the museum and the Institute with your retirement funds. Can you briefly describe your and Jesse's vision in creating the museum and institute? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so when we were in the US and I lived and worked in the US and I taught and did some research and, and clinical uh, laboratory work, uh, I was in medical schools at like Duke and Yale. Um, and uh, we were doing some activism for Palestine in the US. For example, we had a Wheels of Justice bus tour that took a renovated uh, bus that looks like a hippie bus, you know, uh, around the US, spoke at different schools and universities uh, and uh, community centers, churches, mosques, uh, even synagogues. Um, so we were doing some work for Palestine. And then there was a time in my life when I said, okay, enough of this in the US and time for me to go do some of this in my home country. So I, we decided to come back here. And uh, also there were some personal reasons as my mother was aging and I wanted to be around her. Uh, so there were uh, some mixed reasons for coming back, but primarily it's about um, service in Palestine. I mean, when Zionists used to challenge me in the US, sometimes a couple of Zionists would say, well, you know, it's easy for you to say this, you're not living there. So I want to live here and then I can <laughs> uh, be more obvious about it. And so the museum and the Institute, these were your two vehicles uh, because of your background, because of your interests, and both the museum, which has artifacts uh, from the area, but also this Institute, right, for uh, biodiversity and sustainability. I mean, that really is the heart of your operation, isn't it, where you do research, you have various projects, uh, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, the Institute, uh was established with a vision of sustainable human and natural communities. 
basically how do we humans uh, live on this earth in harmony with nature and uh, continue to live here even against all odds against the program to ethnically cleanse Palestine of non-Jews uh, to create the Jewish state of Israel that started uh, decades ago and is still ongoing. Uh, we have uh, now 14 million Palestinians in the world. Two thirds of us are refugees or displaced people. This is a meticulous program of ethnic cleansing that has been going on for more than <clears throat> seven decades now. And so the Institute's vision of sustainability uh, is important, of course, for the indigenous people of Palestine, but also for the nature of Palestine, because colonialism uh, and Zionism is uh, simply a form of colonialism. Colonialism does impact the environment and does destroy the environment. Yeah, I want to ask you. I want to ask you about both of those uh, in just a minute. Um, one of the things <laughs> I want to <clears throat> dig down deep into the research that you do right now. Uh, you reported just in your latest newsletter, and by the way, I <clears throat> maybe you want to give a plug plug for that. But I really I read from uh, top to bottom your weekly, regular, uh, email newsletters to your groups. And so uh, I really would encourage people to, to be in touch and to, to sign up for that. You, you reported that you published 24 research papers in 2022. Uh, without going into you know everyone, can you say a little bit more about <laughs> some of the research that you and your students and, and volunteers are doing? Uh, yes, I mean, it's a variety of topics, but they are all, uh, again, centered on this theme of sustainability, sustainability of people, sustainability of nature. So they include papers on biodiversity, for example, on protected area management, uh, protecting certain areas where threatened endangered species are present. They include some papers on environmental justice issues. Uh, they include papers on uh, how we make peace uh, by uh, restoring justice, uh, basically. And, uh, and these, these are the kinds of papers that my students and I work on. Uh, they are focused, but they have many topics ranging from ethnography to medic medicine and COVID-19. For example, we did a study on effects of COVID-19 on... Uh, on uh, biodiversity, we did a study on how we educate uh, children about climate change. Uh, they sound like different areas, but they are all focused on the same area, which is sustainability of human and natural communities. You know, I, I don't have this written down as one of my questions, but as you talk, <clears throat> one of the places that my, my uh, Solidarity Tour groups visits is uh, uh, Al-Khan al-Amr. The, the Bedouin, the, the Bedouin uh, village, the Bedouin camp uh, on, the, on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. And they've been under destruction order for gosh, how many years now? And uh, we visit with uh, uh, E. Jahanin, the, uh, the tribal elder there. And he was telling me about not only their plans to destroy, Israeli plans to destroy al Khanal Amr, their, their camp, which has this wonderful school where 200 kids come from all the neighboring uh, uh, camps, but also build a settlement up on the hill overlooking uh, al Khan al-Amr with a, with a tourist Bedouin village so that tourists can come to see this Israeli tourist Bedouin camp. Do you do much research? Have you done much research or do you know much about al Khanal Amr that you'd like to share? Yes. Uh, I mean, the Jehalin uh, community uh, tribe basically is uh, a tribe that was ethnically cleansed from the Negev in 1948 and was sent to live in the Jordan Valley, basically, where they uh, tended sheep and goats in the Jordan Valley which is not as rich as the Northern Negev where they were driven out from. 
And then Israel occupied the Jordan Valley and the rest of the West Bank, the rest of Palestine in 1967. And they removed the Jehaleen a second time up the hill to the desert area, which you visited uh, near Khan al Ahmar, where they live. It's not an easy or comfortable life. Their sheep and goats don't have many green pastures, so to speak, to eat. That's right. And now they want to move them a third time, basically. They want them to kick them out and move them to a trash dump site, actually. This is basically uh, the history of this tribe. Uh, yes, we are interested in issues like this, and we work to research them. My, uh, one of my master students is actually looking into doing a master thesis on uh, desert tourism and how, how this can help uh, Bedouins and others survive on their land. Yeah, in fact, I think that the next uh, the next uh, uh, destruction orders to take place sometime in February. And from what I understand, the new uh, the the new government has indicated to the courts already, and the judge has indicated that there's no reason why Al Khan Al Amr uh, shouldn't be destroyed. So it's not looking very very good for them. Yes. When Mar when Mark and I were with you. Uh, 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 right before Thanksgiving, uh, Mazen, you were heading to Batir. Batir is this US UNESCO World Heritage Site, and it has recently declared Batir, UNESCO has recently declared a Batir, quote, in danger after finding that the landscape had become vulnerable under impact of sociocultural and geopolitical transformations that could bring irreversible damage to its authenticity and integrity. So tell us about Batir, why it's important, why it's in danger, and then as a, as a, 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 a coda at the end, talk to us about Hassan Mustafa. Yeah, sure. Um, so Batir is one of the many villages in the Western uh, Bethlehem region. Bethlehem governorate now is, uh, about 220,000 Palestinians and 150,000 Israeli Jewish settlers that live in Bethlehem district. The Bethlehem district has three major towns, Bethlehem, Beit Sahur, which is my village, and Beit Jala, uh, or town Beit Sahur. And it also includes, Bethlehem includes many villages on the western slopes, basically heading to the Mediterranean. Uh, this group of villages, cluster of villages called Al Arkub uh, villages, and one of them is Batir. Now, Batir and Al Walaja, and each one of those villages, Hussein, Al Khadr, has its own unique history and interest for us as people who are, again, interested in uh, how people get to survive under relentless. Uh, method or process of trying to ethnically cleanse them. So Batir has an interesting story in that it was actually depopulated briefly in 1948 until this guy Hassan Mustafa, he went to the place where the refugees were huddled and he told them, look, we should go back to our village and we should resist. At least we should show that the village is populated because when villages are unpopulated, the Israeli army can come into them. So he went back to the village with a group of young men brave enough to, to uh, basically light the houses or every house they would light at night. They would uh, make noise and turn on radios and um, made the Israeli army think, think that the village is heavily defended. Uh, and then the Israeli army was forced to negotiate with Hassan Mustafa, and uh, who was then the uh, village council head. And uh, so Batir was repopulated, and that's its uniqueness as a village uh, that it was repopulated by an act of civil disobedience, basically, uh, that prevented the Batiri people from being refugees. And so Hazan Mustafa is considered a hero in uh, Batir. And I was just elected uh, vice president 
of Hassan Mustafa Cultural Center in Batir. So we're, we're trying to maintain his heritage and his, uh, and so the day you were here, I was actually heading to Batir about this issue of uh, maintaining the heritage of Hassan Mustafa and the popular resistance of Batir. And that there, there's an ecological crisis uh, uh, in Batir today uh, because of the occupation. Yeah. Yes, uh, there are three valleys around Batir, and those valleys are being attacked by the Zionists uh, who are building settlements all around the area. And uh, you mentioned the UNES uh, designation as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, which I and many others worked on to try and do this because we thought it could protect Batir, and it indeed at least delayed the implementation of the apartheid wall in Batir. Israel is building the segregation apartheid wall that intends to separate people from their land. And they were planning to build it around Batir. For the time being, it has not been built around Batir. It was built around villages nearby like al -Walaja. Uh, and al Walaja lost all of its land basically as a village uh, to the Zionist uh, project. Batir still has access to its uh, land, most of them I would say. Uh, so there's, there's hope in Batir and we try to strengthen the resilience of the population in Batir. Do I remember correctly, it's, uh, uh, it was at uh, al Walaja there, where you were arrested? Yes, more than once. Yeah, Three, more than four, once. Five times, I don't remember. <laughs> uh, can you, I know it's happening all over uh, the occupied Palestinian territories, Mazen, but uh, can you give us a couple of other particularly egregious examples where the Israeli occupation is harming kind of the, the delicate uh, ecological balance of a particular village or, or, or the, uh, the natural habitat? Well, I mean, there are thousands of examples sure. that I could give, but uh, I mean, we have to remember if we step back and look at the big picture, that Palestine had about uh, 1,500 villages and communities, towns uh, before 1948, and that before 1948, uh, most Palestinians, 75% of them were subsistence farmers who lived in harmony with nature. Those villages lived in relative harmony with nature uh, and uh, pro protecting the wildlife around them and the springs and the water sources, etc. Then came the Zionist project in 1948, creating the state of Israel, where 530 communities were depopulated. And when you depopulate the indigenous people, of course, you don't care about the land. So Zionist uh, forces not only destroyed those villages, uh, they destroyed all the crops around the villages, both domesticated trees and wild trees. And uh, they bulldozed even the wild trees like uh, oaks and hawthorn and carobs, etc. Um, and they planted instead of these indigenous multitude of species of trees, they planted uh, pine trees, uh, a uniform monoculture of pine trees. And now pine trees, I have nothing against pine trees, they are suitable for Northern Europe, uh, but they're not suitable here. And they are very uh, devastating to the biodiversity and rich biodiversity of Palestine. So this was the beginning, basically. And from then on, there are many, many examples, like the diversion of the water of the Jordan River, uh, which dried it up. And the, the Jordan River is no longer a river. It has dropped down from the 1950s uh, level of um, 1,350 million cubic meters per year to now it's 20 million cubic meters per year. And so it's actually uh, more like a stream than a, than a river. Now you could literally walk across it. 
this devastated the Jordan Valley ecosystem. And, and when you devastate these ecosystems, again, it's intended, of course, by the Zionist project to devastate life for the indigenous people, for the Palestinians. But of course, it has an impact on other living creatures, uh, animals and plants in the area. I'm glad you brought up the Jordan River and the Jordan Valley. <clears throat> um, let me just continue the, the question a little bit about, uh, about uh, the water sources by asking you about the Dead Sea. I mean, <clears throat> I've been coming, I, I look around the screen and many of these folks have been solidarity activists with Palestinians for much longer than I have been, but I first came to Palestine in 1998 and I remember the Dead Sea was one sea. <clears throat> I mean, it had receded, you know, by then, but there was still one body of water. Now it, it, it's two pieces of water separated and it continues to recede because of the siphoning off of the Jordan River water to settlements and other, other, uh, uh, other entities north of the Dead Sea. I've heard all kinds of plans, right? Uh, pipe water in from the Black Sea, from the Mediterranean, from the Red Sea, I, all kinds of crazy plans. Talk a little bit about the Dead Sea and that issue. And what do you, where do you think, what do you think is gonna happen? Well, I mean, first of all, the Dead Sea is neither dead nor, nor <laughs> it is a sea. That's <laughs> correct. And the, <laughs> the Salty Lake, uh, yes. <laughs> And it was fed by the Jordan River, but now, as you pointed out, it's been shrinking, which creates all sorts of environmental havoc uh, from sinkholes to other things. And already of the 12 uh, species of algae uh, that were in the Dead Sea, uh, so-called Dead Sea or the Lake of Lot, uh, there's now only two or three left. So, <clears throat> So it is devastating in terms of environmental impact to the shrinkage of the Dead Sea. It's the lowest point on earth and it's getting lower, of course. Uh, so we'll see what happens in the future, but, uh, uh, but I think the answer to uh, the problems of the Dead Sea water is simply to allow the water flow back through the Jordan River as it was. Uh, which is something that Israel refuses to do because I want to starve both Jordanians and Palestinians of their water. Uh, this is the real reason for, uh, for what they do. Uh, it is not an economic uh, useful project to divert the waters from Lake Tiberias to the West. It was not an economic feasible pro project also to dry up the Lake Hula and wetlands of the Hula in the north, uh, which were a major place for migrating birds. You know, 500 plus million birds pass through Palestine on annual migration between Eurasia and Africa because Palestine is that bottleneck uh, between Eurasia and Africa. Yeah. Uh, and one could talk about all sorts of other environmental problems but the point that maybe we should make is that, you know, human rights injustices and violations of native and indigenous rights is always tied to the violations of nature uh, by the colonizers. I mean, uh, you in North America know very well that the European colonizers, for example, killed two million buffaloes uh, and especially where you are, Michael, in the Midwest and yeah. all these areas, uh, they killed the buffaloes because they were the livelihood of the native people and they wanted, they wanted to reshape the country and that's what they do. You know, <clears throat> it, uh, I like what you said before about the idea of sustainability being the, the chief, the central goal of the Institute because of the intimate and integral connection between human sustainability and planetary creation sustainability you know uh, and um yeah that that's such an important connection that your institute makes 
Tell me, uh, in your in your latest newsletter, you reported that in 2022, um, in addition to all your scholarly publications and environmental research, you started a uh, uh, a mobile educational unit. And Mark and I, Jesse, took us into uh, the the unit, and we were just so impressed with it. So t tell us about the mobile unit, where it goes what it does, why it's important for your members. Yeah, I mean, uh, it was an important project for us because early on, actually, in our work here, we realized we cannot expect, you know, remote schools to uh, muster the resources uh, to put their students on buses and take them to a natural history museum or an ethnography museum or a botanical garden, which are all things that we have here. So we wanted to at least take a glimpse of, of this uh, issues of sustainability and issues of human and biological diversity. We want to take a mobile unit that brings this knowledge to remote, especially remote schools and communities, and especially those in area C, which is 60% uh, of the West Bank that's under uh, more direct uh, assault by the Israeli occupation army uh, that tries to remove any people that are living there because they want those 60% of the land of the West Bank to be eventually annexed to Israel as they annexed East Jerusalem, for example, which is now off limits to Palestinians from the West Bank. But going to these remote areas is a, is a way of giving hope to the people there, giving knowledge, giving science, yeah, giving them something that uh, says, look, you're not forgotten, but not only that, you can actually, we can help you if you want to. Uh, we can help you in sustainability projects. We can help you in cultivating your land. We can, uh, you can grow things even on vertical walls, uh, you know, so, so they learn a lot, the children at those schools. I mean, people can go on our Facebook page and just or look on Facebook for Palestine Institute for Biodiversity and Sustainability. And you'll see pictures even from today. Yesterday and today they were in the Hebron area with this mobile unit. And tomorrow they are still in the Hebron area that try to cover one region uh, at a time and a uh, number of trips, because it's very costly to, uh, to truck this mobile unit. So we truck it, we leave it in the center of the region, and then we go back and move it between schools, et cetera. So three days this week was in uh, Hebron. Three days last week, it was in uh, the Bethlehem region, and uh, again, remote areas. One of the questions that I see that Marla Schrader is asking is regarding agro biodiversity. Is anyone collecting and conserving native seed, legumes, etc.? Yes, uh, there is a, a committee of agriculture uh, uh, units that has seed banks. There are seed banks at the National Agricultural Research Center that uh, save heirloom seeds. There's also individual initiatives. Uh, there's academic centers like ours that collect uh, seeds. There's individuals also that collect seeds and maintain them. There's village cooperatives like in Batir, for example, which have also seed banks of uh, Batiri seeds. So yes, uh, that's there. You know, Mazen, every time uh, I visit the museum and institute, there's something new happening. One of the things in the works, uh, and Jesse took us up uh, up the hill, is this building, this uh, building that will be part of the Institute and the museum uh, at the top of the hill that maybe will double the size uh, of uh, the museum. Tell us about that and maybe what else is on the horizon. Yeah, as you point out, we keep growing. Uh, we, uh, we found that you know, our growth is driven by the need of the society. You know, the, 
the people tell us we want you to work in these areas and and we think you can help us more. I mean, I myself was not an uh, agricultural specialist. I was a biodiversity uh, specialist, but we went into agriculture and agrobiodiversity and agriculture, permaculture, uh, eco-friendly agriculture, because the society wants it, the people want it. They want to grow healthy food that is devoid of pesticides and insecticides, and they want our support in these things. So that drove our move in, in that direction. The same when we started uh, working on uh, our cultural history. Again, I'm not a historian or a cultural anthropologist or anything, uh, <clears throat> but people said, look, we have this history that Israel is targeting and it's being lost both tangible and intangible cultural heritage. Uh, so this is our, our heritage, which we need to protect. So help us protect it. So we moved in that direction. So as we continue to grow, of course, and our team continues to grow, we need more space. So there was this building that was used as a residence for non, nuns at Bethlehem University, who worked at Bethlehem University. There were two nuns left in there building the rest of it was empty so the university finally took the decision to give us a use of the building if we renovated the stuff and so we will uh, renovate a small building near the university where the two nuns will be moved to and then we will have close to a thousand square meters um, <clears throat> you know that uh, that's almost uh, what, 9,000 or, or so feet. Um, but anyways, uh, this, this will be a nice national museum of natural history. Uh, so we need, I mean, we didn't get all the money we want to do this, uh, but I'm hoping it'll, it'll show as we start working uh, that we can do the exhibits inside and do some interactive exhibits uh, to have a children's room, finally, where children can come and play and enjoy games. We're now even constructing games here on climate change and other things. So, uh, so yeah, we're excited about this step. This is a big step for us, as you pointed out, more than double our existing floor space. So it, it will be nice. It was really exciting. Uh, was it three or four stories or uh, uh, it, it was just really an exciting prospect as we as we toured it with Jesse. Yeah. One of my favorite places at, uh, at the Institute is um, touring the uh, area that's dedicated to hydroponics. Tell us about tell us about your foray in the hydroponics. Uh, tell us about that particular area and what, what you're accomplishing there and what you're hoping to do. Yeah. Uh, well, the, the story of the aquaponic and hydroponic system is kind of interesting. Uh, there was a, a colleague of mine who came to the museum and I had worked with him in another permaculture farm a little bit. And uh, he is from Switzerland. And he said, uh, we need to... Uh, you know, to build some aquaponics in Palestine, introduce Palestinian farmers to using aquaponics and hydroponics, uh, you know, and, and I thought it was a good idea. And we did some crowdfunding for him uh, to do this. And then GIZ, the German uh, 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 NGO that's interested in sustainability, uh, gave us a little bit more money and it was not just money to build these systems, but to train people in building the systems, use building the three systems that we have. Uh, for those of you who don't know, aquaponics is a way to grow fish and vegetables at the same time in limited space with limited water, very little water evaporation happens. So it's a very interesting technology as you circle the water from the fish that has basically a fish poop and fertilizers <laughs> that, that grows the vegetables. 
so so that's how that came and we brought some people from Gaza at the time. This was the first project we actually executed on the grounds of the Institute here. I think it was 2015 uh, when we built that system. So uh, three systems and we brought some people from Gaza. Took a while to get the permissions for them, for them to come from Gaza to the West Bank, because as you know, Gaza is under siege. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a question uh, from Cliff Bennett, uh, Mazen. What's the estimated cost of renovating this building uh, for the museum? Well, we need uh, some uh, 1.5 million. We have about 1.1 million raised. So we're short about $400,000. So if and you have a rich hand or uncle, please let us know. <laughs> <laughs> Or you can contribute, of course, fifty dollars or a hundred dollars. Things accumulate, and you'll you'll take that too, won't you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> one of the uh, uh, one 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 more question about the the uh, museum and institute. Uh, you're connected to Palestinian organizations working on national strategies, and you collaborate with local and global organizations working on ecological, environmental justice, and the protection of the planet. Tell us about some of those national and international strategies that you talked about in your latest newsletter. Yeah, I mean, the world is globalized, of course, these days. And uh, since the people started understanding what we biologists have been warning about, like climate change and habitat destruction and you know, destruction of uh, biodiversity around the globe that, you know, most of the large animals have disappeared or will disappear very shortly. Uh, when we been warning about this for decades and now more and more people are uh, realizing this is serious business. And there were a number of international treaties that were then signed as the Finally, things trickle up to the politicians. So the international treaties that were signed include things like the Paris Accord on Climate Change or the Convention on Biological Diversity. Uh, there's meetings now going on in Montreal, for example, about the Convention on Biological Diversity with the what's called COP, the Co Conference of Parties that signed these agreements. Palestine has signed a number of agreements in 2015 uh, as part of its uh, coming out of the closet, so to speak, out of the darkness uh, to be recognized by many UN agencies as a state in the making. So they signed the Convention on Biological Diversity, they signed the Convention on Climate Change, among many others. Uh, but they didn't really have good strategies or action plans or, or really understood that signing these conventions carries uh, both uh, privilege and obligations on us as Palestinians. So this is another thing I'm very proud of, that this institute has become a trusted national center for strategies that work for putting action plans that work on the ground. So we are, for example, we just finished uh, drafting a national biodiversity strategy and action plan. Over 450 uh, stakeholders participated in this. We were the lead uh, organization that put it together. And in this uh, national strategy, there are 17 targets, including on things like protected areas and species conservation. Uh, and under these 17 targets, there are um, 76 uh, action plans that are very specific using smart criteria for achievements. One, one last question about the Institute and Museum itself, Mazen. You know, whenever you come, you see students, volunteers, and others who work at the Museum and Institute. 
if some of us wanted to come and volunteer, uh, what kind of projects do you uh, have your volunteers and students working on? Yeah, we've had uh, volunteers from more than 45 countries, I think. Uh, and, uh, in, uh, and volunteers come with different levels and different backgrounds. Uh, we do start now to select volunteers because our space is limited. Uh, but generally, the, in the past, they have come from a different background or even no education or and things like that. But we do find work for each volunteer because uh, depending on their skills and their interest, uh, they can help in whatever area they choose to, uh, you know, <clears throat> whether if they have background in agriculture or in uh, farming or gardening, they can help in the garden. If they have experience in databases, they can help with that, et cetera. I mean, Peter here is, uh, uh, who's on the call is, uh, has experience in management and he helped us in reorganizing and remanaging, you know, the personnel relationship inside the museum so different people contribute in whatever things that they have interest and experience in or just interest in, even if they're not experienced, they can contribute. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about the, uh, the new government <clears throat> in Israel. Um, in, on, on the one hand, right, um, you, they've exchanged one apartheid government for another. So when I talk to my Palestinian friends, they say, well, there's no difference. But on the other hand, this is a more right-wing activist uh, government who's threatening to implement all kinds of new regulations. And we've already seen some. Say a word about the new government. Uh, um, and uh, well, just say a word about it. Yeah. I mean, the reason many Palestinians are kind of apathetic about the Israeli elections is because it's kind of predictable that uh, every election brings an even more right-wing government than the one before. But this has been a gradual process that's been happening at uh, every election since the founding of the state. It's predictable because all uh, uh, colonial governments uh, do this. They, they become more extreme and more extreme in time against the native indigenous people. Uh, so Palestinians in the streets say, well, you know, the previous government was worse than the one before it, and the one before it was worse than the one before it, etc. Uh, but we live with it and we have to struggle and we have to survive regardless. And, there, and in any case, there's nothing we can do as Palestinians, of course, because like in apartheid South Africa, the blacks were not allowed to vote. So we, the Palestinians who are subject, or at least most of the Palestinians who remain here, who are subject to this government are not uh, voters. Of course, more than half the Palestinians are refugees outside the country in Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, etc. And those are even in worse situation. So I think, you know, for me personally, I mean, I told you what the street, why the people in the street don't yeah. really uh, think it's important that there's change of government. I, for me, I think actually it is important and I think uh, it does make a difference. It uh, brings Israel uh, more and more to be in a fascist apartheid genocidal regime. And, uh, and I wouldn't put it past the new government when it's sworn in in a week or two. Uh, from engaging in, in another round of ethnic cleansing. And this is not just speculation, this is what they are saying. I mean, the, the people like Smotrich and Ben Gvir, who are fascists, they say we should remove the Palestinians and that uh, the problem was that Ben Gurion didn't do a good enough job at uh, removing the Palestinians. 
Yeah. Um, so we're looking for things to get worse. In other words, my prediction is things will get worse before they get better. We in the U.S. Uh, who stand in, you, you've kind of referenced this uh, a few times throughout uh, our conversation, Mazen, but we in the U.S. who stand in solidarity with our Palestinian friends see a, a, a real comparison, right, between racism and white Christian nationalism in the U.S. Uh, with the racism of the Zionist uh, settler colonial project in Palestine and Israel. Because of the great amount of time you spent in the U.S. Uh, teaching, uh, you can't. You kind of have a unique perspective on the comparison between the two. Uh, share with us your thoughts about that. Uh, yeah, I mean, what I learned by traveling, and not just in the U.S., I traveled uh, to a lot of countries, more than 40 countries I've traveled or lived in or uh, visited. And uh, what I learned is, you know, and this is something that perhaps all of us should learn, is that this is indeed one small world called planet Earth, and we share the same problems and the same challenges and the same idiocies of greed and, and envy and other vices of human uh, uh, nature, if you want. It's human nature. It's not... European nature or Israeli nature or American or whatever. It's just human nature that we have these tendencies that uh, are very destructive. They are destructive to fellow human beings and they are destructive to nature. And, uh, you know, and I, I mean, sometimes I'm just floored by the similarities, for example, between the language that was used by the European colonizers in North America yeah. and the language used by the Israeli Zionist colonizers in our country, uh, almost verbatim, you know, circling the wagons, protecting ourselves from savages who are intent on killing us. You know, we are uh, democratic, we are bringing uh, justice and bringing, you know, shiny city on a hill, uh, <laughs> manifest destiny, you know, uh, God's chosen people, God sent us to this country to civilize it. You know, there is kinds of language that's used there. And that's the language of the oppressor. And then the language of the oppressed people is also very similar to, to other oppressed people and, and the way they behaved and so forth. So, so there is this commonality of humanity that uh, that's the lesson I learned from, you know, thank God I lived in the US for a while because uh, the US still, you know, despite all its uh, flaws and problems, you have people from many, many countries living in this one country. Yes, on stolen Native American lands, but nevertheless, I was uh, part of you, if you want. And uh, I still have US citizenship, of course, I still pay my taxes, which go to support Israel, but <laughs> that's another story. Uh, so so we need to, uh, we need to think of not ourselves as Americans or as Palestinians or as Israelis, but as human beings and that we have these problems are common problems and common, um, common ills of humanity that we all have to tackle. And if we don't tackle them, you know, 200 years ago, it was okay not to tackle them. You had localized genocide like King Leopold in, in of Belgium who, uh, you know, in the Congo killed millions of people. Um, uh, but they were localized. Now, nowadays, we cannot afford these localized genocides because they are becoming a global genocide, like with climate change and habitat destruction. And there will not be a livable planet for us if we don't work together. I want to ask you. <clears throat> I want to ask you about something that's uh, uh, kind of painful, uh, but. We hear 
about an increasing number of Palestinians, particularly Palestinian Christians, and especially among young Palestinian Christians, emigrating from Palestine, uh, moving abroad and staying abroad uh, for a variety of reasons. Now, uh, the indigenous Palestinian Christian population around one around one percent or so uh, in Palestine and in uh, Israel. Um, it's painful uh, for a number of reasons, right? Uh, am I am I correct or am I wrong that there's that there's a shift from people of our generation who remember uh, who remember the uh, uh, Intifada, the first Intifada, the kind of what I would call the Intifada generation, and then the kids of the Intifada generation who are wanting, looking for something more, something else. Talk to me about the, the, that shift and whether that's co a correct read or not. Well, I mean, we have had uh, 14 uprisings, plus or minus one or two, depending on how you count them, 14 uprisings or 14 intifadas. The first one was in the late 19th century, 1880, when the first Zionist colonies were built in Palestine uh, at the expense of Palestinian natives. Uh, these uprisings are waves, you know, they come and go. Uh, and then it is a generational issue. Uh, younger people generally will uh, be engaged in more revolutionary spirit and, uh, and they tend to, uh, to build a new cycle of uprisings after the older generation has kind of uh, uh, gotten tired, et cetera. So in terms of the immigration and, and leaving the country, uh, yes, there's been some of this going back, actually, some of it is not even related to Zionism. Uh, it has more to do with the economy of the late 19th century. For example, many Palestinians live in Latin America, yeah. and many Palestinian Christians, including some from my relatives who left about 120 years ago. They don't even speak Arabic or English. They speak Spanish, for example, in Chile and Argentina and so forth. Um, and then, of course, came Zionism and made things much worse uh, for the local people. Uh, so most people who choose to leave the country and settle elsewhere, they do it for economic reasons. And, uh, and the pressure of Zionism here, which has been intent on making life miserable here for the local people, I mean, that's what colonialism does anyway. It destroys the economy of the indigenous people while building the economy of the settlers. This is the nature of colonialism. Uh, this adds the pressure on the native people who are here to leave the country. And some of them choose to leave the country. Uh, I happen to have two uh, brothers and one sister who, lives, who live in the US, for example, for economic reasons and escaping the difficulties of life here. So that happens. Uh, you know, of course, the Zionists want to make a distinction between Palestinian Christians and Muslims, and they tend to try and uh, draw a wedge between us. My family is Christian, by the way. And uh, so <clears throat> they want us to, they want Muslims and Christians to think that there's a difference between them. But in reality, there's no difference. The pressure is applied to all non-Jews here under the rule of the Jewish state of Israel. You know, one of the, uh, in addition to your work with um, the museum and the Institute and in environmental justice, um, perhaps everybody on the screen knows this, but you're the author of one of the most important books, I think, on the history of Palestinian resistance, popular resistance in Palestine, a history of hope and empowerment. And it's one of the books that we suggest uh, our travelers read when I lead uh, solidarity tours to the region. And it's just a one, I mean, it's an important, it's an important book with many insights. 
um, and you tie your work in environmental justice and sustainable agriculture as part of your longstanding commitment to nonviolent resistance. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's uh, resistance in general to colonialism. If we take, I don't know, this uh, Native American resistance or the Black uh, South African resistance to colonialism, resistance takes many, many, many forms, you know? And uh, Gene Sharp, for example, uh, uh, listed like 200 and, or 199 forms of resistance. Uh, there's actually much more than that. If I count the forms that Palestinians engaged in, there are close to 300 forms of resistance. Um, most of them are nonviolent forms, of course, uh, from civil disobedience to boycotts, to media work, to demonstrations, etc. cetera. Um, but, uh, but the issue of resistance is important to study also so that we can understand what's going on in, the, in these contexts and not to uh, uh, you know, resort to these facile uh, kind of uh, generalizations about people and about cultures. You know, uh, I first got involved, for example, in, uh, in 1980 when I was like uh, you know, 21 years old, 22 years old uh, in uh, the US, 1979, 1980. Uh, on uh, South African uh, systems. I was not involved in the Palestinian struggle. I was uh, elected president of the uh, International Student Club at the University of Connecticut when I was doing my master's there. And uh, at the time, uh, this black guy comes to me and says, you know, so you're now president, congratulations. What are you going to do about South Africa? And I was a naive young person. I said, what's wrong with South Africa? <laughs> and of course, he educated me, and we ended up doing some actions for South Africa. But uh, one time I was challenged about these actions by a white guy and who came to me and said, so you support these guys that you know do this, this thing? And he showed me this article about necklacing where they used to put rubber tires around people and burn them alive. And I said, no, I don't support this kind of action, but this is, uh, you know, th this is expected under a system of apartheid and different people have different backgrounds and some of them, you know, do horrible things, but the majority do decent things and struggle and resist. And I support that kind of resistance. And so this, the same way I say, you know, we, we need to educate people about the system and how the system creates resistance and how, and how the system is a system of oppression and, and genocide, basically. I just have a few more questions, Mazen. Uh, um, one of the relatively recent <clears throat> forms of solidarity, uh, uh, of solidarity uh, with with Palestinians and Palestine, I mean, and it's growing. And, and by the way, in other parts of the world too, is uh, ecotourism. Uh, talk about how the institute is promoting ecotourism. Yeah, um, I actually teach, teach a master uh, program in uh, tourism and hotel management uh, here at Bethlehem University. And we talk a lot about ecotourism uh, and also other forms of uh, tourism, you know, cultural tourism, agricultural tourism. There are many, many forms of alternative, what's called alternative tourism beyond the usual tourism that people carry. In the case of Palestine, I mean, my understanding is most people who come to Palestine in the past or who came to Palestine in the past were on, uh, on religious tourism to visit the holy places. Uh, <clears throat> but, uh, but increasingly, there's been other kinds of tourism. 
you came on one of those tourisms. I call it, uh, you know, human rights tourism or solidarity tourism. Uh, and that's that's another form of tourism we should not ignore. I think all these alternative forms of tourism, if they are done right, and if their intention is to help the native people uh, stay on their land and help the land uh, stay healthy and sustainable, that's where ecotourism comes in, if it's managed well, uh, then that's important. Uh, by the way, just because the time is running out, if uh, people want to be on my email list, I put my email in the chat and they can email me and I'll add them to my email list. That would be nice. So that's mazin at kumsia.org. M-A-Z-I-N at Q-U-M-S-I-Y-E-H dot org. You know, uh, speaking about ecotourism, there, there are a number of uh, Palestinian tour guides now who are specializing, right, in ecotourism. I'm, I'm thinking of our friend Osama Zubi, for example, who, uh, who kind of specializes in the, the hikes and the flora and the fauna uh, and getting out uh, into um, uh, 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 the environment and spending the night camping, et cetera. He was my student. I, I was figuring. Well, I taught a lot of those tour guides. <laughs> let me let me ask you, uh, uh, kind of, I'm going to go on a little bit of a different angle here. You know, many of us have been in Bethlehem uh, during uh, the Christmas, the Advent and Christmas season. The Christmas tree was just lit uh, in Manger Square. Uh, tell us about some of the Christmas traditions in the land where Jesus was born. Yeah, I mean, I look with nostalgia as my own childhood here. I mean, in a way, we are lucky to be in this country, the birthplace of Jesus. It's very special, especially in this season. You know, my village, Beit Sahur, is a shepherd field where my ancestors were those shepherds that the Bible spoke about who heard the angels sing and walked up to Bethlehem, which is literally just less than a, a mile uh, from my house, where Jesus, uh, according to our traditions, was born. Uh, so it's very, very special to hear, uh, for example, on Christmas night. And we have, by the way, three Christmas nights, because we have <laughs> The uh, Catholic Eastern, uh, you know, Western uh, calendar, we have the Eastern calendar, and we have the Armenian calendar, in which, you know, uh, so 25 December, 7 January, and 17 January are three Christmases we celebrate. And in those Christmases, we hear carols singing from around the world, you know, where teams from around the world. Sometimes uh, during the COVID-19, we did this virtually online, basically a lot of these carols and songs, etc. So it is very special. I mean, when I was in school, uh, I am not a religious person. You know, I'm not very religious. I don't go to church every Sunday or anything, but uh, I used to, when I was, when I walked back from my school in Bethlehem to Beit Sahur, I would pass by the Church of Nativity, go in there, uh, just, just to sit and contemplate and watch the candles burning. You know, it's, it's uh, for us, Jesus, regardless of our, and even Palestinian Muslims, of course, recognize this also equally, that Jesus is our hero. Uh, to the Muslims, he was a prophet. Uh, to the Christians, he's the son of God. But in either case, he was a revolutionary person who changed humanity and changed our lives. And it, it all happened right here in our backyard, so to speak. So we're very lucky about this. And we appreciate the attention that the world pays to this place. And when I went to the US, and I would go to the churches, speak at churches, attend the uh, you know, worship there. And uh, they asked me for my reflections. And I, 
you know, and they sing, oh, little town of Bethlehem, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, I'm from there. <laughs> I was born there, <laughs> you know, so. I've got, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to let you have some parting thoughts in just a minute, but I have one last question for you. You end each one of your mailings with the charge, stay human. And then you sign your name, you call yourself a Bedouin in cyberspace, a villager at home. Tell us about that. Well, the second part is my own writing. The first part, uh, stay human, is actually how uh, our colleague and friend, uh, the late Vittorio Arrigoni, an Italian solidarity activist, used to end his emails, you know, uh, in Italian, of course, not in English. But uh, uh, so I, I think, you know, he was killed in Gaza, I think, by uh, intelligence agents from a local government, but we won't get into that. Um, but anyways, uh, he, he was uh, interested in us connecting and staying as human family, as I was mentioning earlier, because the struggles we face are all joint struggle. And when people like Victoria who got killed in Palestine or Rachel Corey, if you know, an American student who came, uh, also we knew her, I knew her before she got killed. And uh, she went to Gaza and was run over by an Israeli bulldozer. Uh, I think, you know, what distinguishes people like that is again, thinking uh, of our connectedness instead of thinking in tribalistic, nationalistic and other terms I could give, but uh, you know, it's the stupidity of uh, humans of otherness. Uh, here we think of ourselves as connected and that's why it's stay human. As for, you know, a Bedouin in cyberspace, because I'm all over the internet, <laughs> I try to be at least. <laughs> and um, and I'm, uh, I'm a villager literally at home. I cultivate plants and I grow them. We harvested the olives uh, just recently and that's what I do. I want to give you the last word, Mazen, but before I do, I want to again thank uh, our co-sponsors uh, for, uh, for the uh, interview today. Uh, you can see them on the screen. I'll just let you have a second to read them. Uh, but Mazen, uh, any last thoughts you'd like to share with us today? Well, thank you for uh, this opportunity to reflect. And I like the style of the interview that you did, not the lecture. Uh, question and answer is always good. Uh, I mean, I'm happy to also answer a question from the audience if they want to email me or or ask them here if they want to. Uh, but, you know, parting thoughts is, um, I don't know, I think, you know, uh, I have been happy, happiest, I should say, when I thought, when I have a, a project bigger than myself and being involved in projects bigger than ourselves and helping other people who are uh, more needy than we are uh, is uh, the ultimate uh, sense of being truly human. So I would uh, say like Victoria would say, stay human. Thank you. Uh, we're really grateful, Mazen, to you and to Jesse uh, for your witness for the work of the Museum and Institute. Uh, and so on behalf of everyone on the screen, uh, thank you. We hope to see you in, in uh, Bethlehem and in Beit Zahor soon. I want to say thanks again to our co-sponsors and to all of you for attending today. Wishing you all a blessed holiday season, and we'll see you in the new year.